Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus. So right across the front we have, there is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. This is a non-fiction book on philosophy by the great Camus. I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So... Inspired by the myth of the man condemned to ceaselessly push a rock up a mountain and watch it roll back to the valley below, the myth of Sisyphus transformed 20th century philosophy with its impassioned argument for the value of life in a world without religious meaning. And uh, it is hard going, it's difficult to read at times, but it also does contain quite a lot of food for thought, especially on the subject of absurdism. So we have uh, here absurdity and suicide. There is but one truly serious philosophical problem and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. All the rest, whether or not the world has three dimensions, whether the mind has nine or twelve categories, comes afterwards. These are games one must first answer. And if it is true, as Nietzsche claims, that a philosopher, to deserve our respect, must preach by example, you can appreciate the importance of that reply, for it will precede the definitive act. These are facts the heart can feel. Yet they call for careful study before they become clear to the intellect. So he says here, suicide has never been dealt with except as a social phenomenon. On the contrary, we are concerned here at the outset with the relationship between individual thought and suicide. An act like this is prepared within the silence of the heart, as is a great work of art. The man himself is ignorant of it. One evening he pulls the trigger or jumps. Of an apartment building manager who had killed himself, I was told that he had lost his daughter five years before. That he had changed greatly since and that that experience had undermined him. A more exact word cannot be imagined. Beginning to think is beginning to be undermined. Society has but little connection with such beginnings. The worm is in man's heart. That is where it must be sought. One must follow and understand this fatal game that leads from lucidity in the face of experience to flight from light. He does point out, he says, suicide may be indeed related to much more honorable considerations. For example, the political suicides of protest, as they were called during the Chinese revolution. Uh, he says, in a sense, and as in melodrama, killing yourself amounts to confessing. It is confessing that life is too much for you, or that you do not understand it. Let's not go too far in such analogies, however, but rather return to everyday words. It is merely confessing that that is not worth the trouble. Living, naturally, is never easy. You continue making the gestures commanded by existence for many reasons, the first of which is habit. Dying voluntarily implies that you have recognised, even instinctively, the ridiculous character of that habit, the absence of any profound reason for living, the insane character of that daily agitation, and the uselessness of suffering. He talks, he mentions as well, there's a case of a post-war writer who, after having finished his first book, committed suicide to attract attention to his work. Attention was in fact attracted, but the book was judged no good. I like this line here, he says, The absurd is lucid reason noting its limits. So he says, knowing whether or not man is free doesn't interest me. I can experience only my own freedom. As to it, I can have no general notions, but merely a few clear insights. The problem of freedom as such has no meaning, for it is linked in quite a different way with the problem of God. Knowing whether or not man is free involves knowing whether he can have a master. The absurdity peculiar to this problem comes from the fact that the very notion that makes the problem of freedom possible also takes away all its meaning. For in the presence of God, there is less a problem of freedom than a problem of evil. You know the alternative. Either we are not free and God the all-powerful is responsible for evil, or we are free and responsible but God is not all-powerful. All the scholastic subtleties have neither added anything to nor subtracted anything from the acuteness of this paradox. He says, uh, this is why I cannot get lost in the glorification or the mere definition of a notion which eludes me and loses its meaning as soon as it goes beyond the frame of reference of my individual experience. I cannot understand what kind of freedom would be given me by a higher being. I've lost the sense of hierarchy. The only conception of freedom I can have is that of the prisoner or the individual in the midst of the state. The only one I know is freedom of thought and action. Now if the absurd cancels all my choice now if the absurd cancels all my chances of eternal freedom, it restores and magnifies on the other hand my freedom of action. That privation of hope and future means an increase in man's availability. He says it is good for man to judge himself occasionally. He is alone in being able to do so. He says, a man is more a man through the things he keeps to himself than through those he saves. He quotes Nietzsche as well saying, art and nothing but art. We have art in order not to die of the truth. And then towards the end he has a great uh, essay on uh, Franz Kafka, which is great, especially if you've read The Castle and or The Metamorphosis. He says, the, the human heart has a tiresome tendency to label as fate only what crushes it. But happiness likewise, in its way, is without reason, since it is inevitable. 
Modern man, however, takes the credit for himself when he doesn't fail to recognise it. So yeah, it's a pretty short and sweet book. You can read it in a day or two. There's a pack full of ideas, and to be honest, at times it's kind of overwhelming. Uh, I think I'd need to read it at least another two more times just to make sure that I fully understand all of his arguments. But um, as I went through, I was able to cherry pick different arguments that he made and kind of relate them back to my own life. Uh, investigate the way I thought about things myself and that's kind of what I was hoping for from it. It's a very introspective read that makes you as the reader question what you believe. Uh, so I gave it a 4 out of 5 and would recommend. So there you have it, that's what I made of The Myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.